Hi guys. Thank you so much for coming. We're here for the health-related professions, also known as Allied Health uh, informational session. And today we're going to be covering about 20 different health-related professions. We're gonna talk about the academic requirements for entry. We're gonna talk about what it's like once you're in the program. And we're also going to go over uh, what kind of work they do so that you're clear when you make your choice about which program uh, you're gonna move forward into. And we do have guest speakers from many of the different programs who will just be speaking to their own programs so you don't have to hear uh, Didi and I the whole time. <laughs> but um, my name is Christina Folia and I am one of the program advisors for the health-related professions. I am specifically assigned to you guys as health students. And here you go. So my name is Dee Dee Dendleton, and I'm also a health-related profession program advisor. So me and Christina work together on these 22 programs. So when, if you're interested in one of these programs, you'd come and see one of us at the SSC Center at the West Campus. Yep. This is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm back and forth like that. I'm just going to hold it. I think it'll be easier. <laughs> OK, and you can have this thingy right now. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, we do appreciate you taking the time to be here. And I, I do realize that it is mandatory, but anyways, thanks for being cool about it. And I think that you will learn a lot. And um, we, with that said, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started if that's cool. So um, like I said, we have about 20 different health-related profession programs here at Pima. And a lot of them you don't know about, and I'll guarantee that. So we're gonna start off by talking to you guys about one program that uh, we cannot produce enough graduates from this program. There is a dire need for people to get into clinical research, and we have uh, the program director for clinical research here, Rita Lennon, and she's going to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about how that uh, program works. Take it away, Rita. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I obviously didn't wear the right clothes for this. I'll hold it. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for being here. Sorry, good morning, thank you for being here. I wrote down some stuff because I have a lot of exciting information to share with you and I don't want to forget anything. So, um, so what is clinical research? I'm sure a lot of you aren't even familiar with the terminology when we put those two words together, so I'm going to explain that first, okay? Clinical research is a branch of medicine and healthcare science. Those words sound weird already. Um, where really our ultimate goal is to find a better method. We're finding either better treatments, um, whether that's like a me new medication or um, a new device. Think of like a new kind of way to pack a wound or a new wheelchair or something like that. That could be a device or a new diagnostic tool. Um, that could be something like a new imaging system or a new way to test blood samples. So we're just trying to improve methods in the healthcare system. So uh, that could be anything from top of your head, so hair loss, all the way down to your toes and you know, trying to find a better way to uh, heal wounds on your feet, for instance, and everything in between. Specialists here in Tucson are, are doing clinical research, so all over Tucson you'll find specialists who are working in clinical trials, but that doesn't mean that the entire team is a clinical, re clinical research professional. They might be healthcare professionals that um, are working alongside clinical research professionals. So the program is designed specifically to teach you that, okay? As a research coordinator, that's what the program, this program is specific to, you will be working um, in hospitals and medical facilities. You won't be working in a lab. A lot of people assume that clinical research is lab research, and that's not what it is. So lab research has already occurred, and now we have to test it in humans. We have to find patients who are eligible for the studies and test it with them um, and collect all this information. So clinical trials can occur for a couple of months, they could be for a few years, and you are the person, you are the professional who is making sure that that project is moving forward, and that patients are staying safe, and that all the information that needs to, to um, be collected is being collected properly, okay? Oh my, I'm sorry, is that better? Okay, I'll do that for sure, okay. So let's see, about 35 to 60,000, sorry, 36 to 60,000 is what that says, um, is about what you can expect to make here in Tucson right from 
graduation. And that number, of course, there's a large variance in that number, and that's because it depends on if you're you know, just entry level or if you are starting maybe with a bachelor's degree. About half of our students are coming into the program uh, with a similar profession or a degree that they've already completed, and this is just something else that they're doing. You know, They just want to improve their, uh, the, the possibilities of getting a job, and so they come, they come into it with, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to hold this. Um, with that goal in mind. And so that's the, where the difference is, that's where the variance is. You might start from 35 and move quickly up into the 50s or 60s. Um, if you go to work in Phoenix, you'll definitely make more money. You can also you know, choose to do the part-time option. That's gonna take you more like seven semesters to do. So you'll be doing some work in the summer. So it would be fall, spring, summer, fall, spring, summer, and then probably another fall semester if you wanna do it that way, okay? The program is designed to be completely online. However, there are some courses that you need to come to the classroom for. And if you do need to come to classes, they will be offered at the Northwest campus, but only on Fridays. So if you need to work or you have other responsibilities, you can do those Monday through Thursday, Saturdays and Sundays, and you just need to come to class on Fridays. And the schedule is built to kind of lead up to that. So your first semester, you're only coming to class on Fridays um, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. That last semester, you'll be coming to classes um, on Fridays from about 9 o'clock in the morning till about 6 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm going to stop here. Are there any questions so far that I haven't answered that you have? No? Okay. So the cost of the program is somewhere around $71,000. $7,100. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, we're the most expensive, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You'll get a JAG, you can either get a JAG or you can finish this program. My apologies, $7,100. Um, we are actually one of the least <laughs> expensive programs, not the most expensive programs. And actually that, uh, that number entails the, all of the costs for all the credits, so 61 credits that you have to finish for the program. And that's uh, general education credits, support courses, and then the core courses, the CRC courses that you'll take. That also includes course fees and textbooks for the program, but not course fees and textbooks for the gen ed or the support courses. Okay, so just to let you know that. And there are um, scholarship opportunities. So we just met last night with the scholarship team. Um, and we have that finalized now. However, I don't have a website to share with you. It hasn't gotten that far. So if you are interested in opportunities for scholarship specific to this program, you'll need to email me at this point. Eventually, the program advisors will have information too, but we just haven't gotten it finalized just yet, OK? Um, I think I've nailed everything. Wow, I'm surprised. <laughs> Thanks for listening to me. Are there any questions before I move on? Yes, sir. Uh huh. No, you do not. So that's a very good question. The question was, if you've already completed courses elsewhere, gen ed courses, um, either towards or completed a bachelor's, do you have to repeat those gen eds? And the answer is no. If you've completed English and math and, and all of those sciences, then they, I still honor them. Um, there are some support courses that you may not have taken, even though they're considered gen ed, that are like specific to data and specific to ethics that I will require you to complete. Um, I, will not I will not substitute those out, but those are really the only two then. Thanks for that question. Any other questions? No, okay, thank you so much for uh, meeting, for hearing me today, and I'll give this all the information. <laughs> Cool. Can you just cut that out? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to edit that out later, right? No. <laughs> um, so um, just to kind of echo what Rita said, if you're interested in being on the front end of these human trials um, that are out there doing research for you know cancer treatments, new prosthetics, um, cure for baldness, anything like that, these are the people that get those human those eligible human volunteers together to run these trials. So it really is a fascinating uh, line of work and, and uh, keep it in mind if you hadn't thought about it already. Um, so we're actually gonna switch gears a little bit and next we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, a program that can help you get your education paid or help you to cover the cost of your education. So here at Pima, we have a grant 
which is think of a grant almost like a scholarship. It's the money you don't have to pay back, right? So we have a grant that is specifically here to help students in the healthcare programs. We call it the HPOG grant. I don't know if you guys have heard of HPOG, but we actually have uh, Anel here from HPOG and she's going to explain to you how that grant works. And I really recommend you take some notes down um, so that you can see if this program um, is something that might be able to help you pay for classes. There you go. <laughs> Hi everybody. So like I can say I'm an Costa. I'm the outreach outreach specialist for the HPOC grant. Uh, we are a health um, professional opportunity grant. So we cover 14 different certificate programs throughout Pima. And we're looking for people like you that are interested in the healthcare field. We do have uh, 14 different ones that we cover. We don't those 14 ones are the ones that are in high in demand and that's the one that HPOG chose. Um, you have to attend to one of our info sessions like just this one. I guess Pima loves info sessions. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's your first step. You have to be 18 years old, be, met, be a, a Pima County resident, a low income and be interested in the healthcare field. Um, we do have upcoming info sessions. One, we do have this Friday at 9 a.m. at Arizona Work at the real location. Um, I'm there at 9 a.m., so you guys are more than welcome. We also have afternoon ones. I do have some um, flyers for you to have more information. On the back, you're gonna see the 14 ones that we do cover through HPOC. And then on the front right here, you're gonna see our upcoming uh, info session. You don't have to RSVP, you just show up and say that you're there for an info session. Um, is there any questions? Awesome. So you give, what do you give? You give money, you give So, so um, depending on the program and then depending on the grant year, we can cover you um, the whole program or part of the program. So uh, we help you with tuition, books, scrubs, um, fingerprint cards, uh, CPR, pretty much a lot of stuff. <laughs> so take advantage. We have the money. Come and grab it. <laughs> yes. I have a question for you. I see all these. It's only these that are listed here. Mm -hmm. Radiology is not? No. Unfortunately, it's not. So those are the only ones uh, we're covering through HPOG. Yes. We have other stuff for radiology. I'll get yeah. into that. And also, like through HPOC, you go through Arizona Work or the One Stop, and they also help uh, to see if you're eligible for another grant there. So there are many resources you guys can go and grab and cover your um, education or career field that you choose of. That's all. No, thank you. I feel like I'm in a soap opera. <laughs> We're so fancy. Okay, so um, about some of the programs that are not listed on here, um, still stay tuned. And um, she, she mentioned that there's at the Arizona at Work. Okay, Arizona at Work used to be called One Stop. Just to clarify, a lot of you guys have heard of One Stop, right? That's now called Arizona at Work. Now that's a completely different grant, right? That does cover a lot of the other programs as well as m most of these programs, if not all of them. So maybe you, you are, your program isn't on the HPOG list, but it is on the Arizona at Work list. So um, if you want in information on the Arizona at Work grant, just email me and I'll, I'll send you out the little informational flyer that I put together. But you can pull from both of those buckets if you're in one of these programs here. Um, okay, so we're going to move forward into the next, um, we're gonna switch gears into dental. So, uh, dental assisting, Didi. Um, so, dental assisting. So, what does a dental assistant do? They provide um, patient care and their chair side support to the dentist. So, some of the tasks that they do um, are um, x rays, scheduling, uh, record keeping. Those are some of the things that they do. And so we have this dental assistant program here at Pima. It is a two semester program. It is fall and spring. So it comes, it's starting this fall and then it'll be spring. Um, 
It's, it's a one-year program. It is a certificate. It runs here at the West Campus. Um, and that's about the money that you would make for the dental assisting program, about 36 here in Tucson. The cost <coughs> for this um, program is about, about 6,500. And if, if you didn't notice before, this is one of the HPOG programs that is covered, dental assisting. Does anybody have questions about our dental assisting program? Yes? What is the waiting There actually isn't a waiting list. So you could actually get in this fall. So there is some preparatory coursework, I guess I should say that too. So you do need to take your reading placement and you need to have like a high school biology. They want it like in human anatomy, cells, tissue. Um, if you don't have that, we can put you in a basic one here at Pima. So those are the only requirements. So you'd want to take your placement testing and then if you didn't have a high school, um, biology would get you into one. So if it's something that you're interested in, you want to definitely come see me and Christina soon if, if you want to start in fall. Any other questions? Have you applied? Oh yeah, have you applied? Good question. <laughs> um, so there's actually an application, a program application that you would get from me or Christina um, so what you would need to do is you need to have your reading done right and of course your high school um, transcripts to show your your biology and then you can come and see me and Christina or you can even email us and we could we can check and we can send you the application once you get the application we also walk you through the steps of how you would get into the fall um, start date Anything, any other questions I'm going to pass it over back to Christina. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we didn't break it that bad. Oh, it's just a clip. Yeah, something. Uh, okay, so dental hygiene. Does anybody in here know the difference between a dental assistant and a dental hygienist? Exactly. Wow, nice. And you said it so eloquently. So um, dental hygiene is preventative. That's what she was mentioning. Dental hygiene is the hygiene of the mouth, of the teeth and gums. So dental hygienists work, they don't work chair side with the dentist the way that assistants do. Assistants will take the x-rays, they'll use you know, the suction while they're filling cavities, all of that stuff. Uh, but the hygienists are usually in a different operatory. They make their own schedules with their patients and they will be the ones to do the dental cleanings that you're supposed to get every six months, right? Um, the program is a popular program here at Pima. Um, one of the reasons is because they make pretty good money. Um, on here it says uh, 84, but I wanna be kind of real with you about that number. So that's if you're a full-time working dental hygienist, right? So that's around the range that they found for full-time. A lot of hygienists work part-time. <clears throat> so they're able to kind of put their schedules together and have a little bit more balance. A lot of them do work part-time though, and sometimes part-time at multiple clinics. Um, they're, uh, let's see, it's a two-year program, but this program has prerequisite courses. That means kind of like how Didi was saying, you need to have reading and some biology before you can get into assisting. There are also requirements before you can get into hygiene, but they're a little bit more elevated. So those requirements have to be completed before you can apply to the program. At the point that you have them done, there is a programmatic application that is listed on the website. It's not a paper one, it's on the website. And when you turn it in, um, you get placed on the wait list to start the program. Right now we have more applicants than, what, than seats in the program, right? We have um, at our dental, at our dental uh, learning center here, we have tw 28 operatories which means that we can only take a certain number of students every year, right? So I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about the wait list and how that works. And for those of you who are here inquiring about radiology or respiratory, I want you to tune in because this same wait list process is going to apply to you. Um, all right, cool, let's do it. Okay. So, like I said, um, in dental hygiene, we accept 30 students every fall, okay? So, 
I want you guys to look at this like it's a bucket of students and there's 30 students in here and this bucket is the bucket that's holding all of the fall 2020 students the ones that are going to start in the fall of next year right when this bucket got filled up with students like all these little students in here we got it filled up so then we had more applicants so we were like yeah you're accepted too but you're gonna start in the fall of 2021 right so we had a bunch of applicants in this one right fills up we will continue to open buckets as long as we have applicants okay and so imagine we keep filling up we keep filling up that's 22 that's 23 this is 24 so let's say that when you apply into dental hygiene you get an acceptance letter and it's like congratulations you've made it into the dental hygiene program we're so excited to have you you're going to start in the fall of 2024 and you're like what <laughs> so i don't want you to panic when that happens to you i want to explain to you how this waitlist process works okay so this is you they put you in this bucket right um every single person that is on this wait list there are things you have to do to maintain your place on this wait list so twice a year our admissions team sends an email out to every single person that's on this wait list and that email has three questions do you still want to be on this wait list if there's a chance to start earlier would you like to move up and if there's a chance to be an alternate in our upcoming group would you like to be an alternate we only send this email right here to your my pima email address and when we send it we give you about three weeks to respond which you know you think would be pretty reasonable but what do you think happens what do you think happens while we're waiting for those responses they forget to check their emails maybe they forget to check their emails maybe they get into a different program they get accepted into nursing Maybe they move to Montana. Maybe they decide to start a family. Whatever it is that happens, we lose people. Like this guy's gone. This girl's gone. We lose. We lose almost a third of the students on this wait list every time that we do those cleanups. So I want you to think of the, the void that that creates in each of these buckets, right? So now all of a sudden, these are not full buckets anymore. So in order to make sure that every single start date is gonna be full, we'll move students up. We'll say, oh, okay, well, you were 2022. Guess what, now you're, we're gonna welcome you over to 2021. And then you were 2023, you're gonna move up. And then all these people are gonna move up here, and then this one is eliminated. It doesn't even exist anymore because we've moved all those students forward, okay? So the number one most important thing for those students who enter into a wait list, radiology, respiratory, or dental hygiene, you must check your Pima emails regularly, and if you do still want to be on this wait list, you have to tell us, or we will remove you from the wait list. There are, there are too many people eager to get in, and, and we really need you guys to be responsible and, and check the emails. So if you miss the email, and then you see it like two weeks later, we, your application is gone. You have to actually apply again, and you would be at the back of the line. So let's say that you had waited six months already and 14 people have applied since you applied. Now those 14 people are in front of you in line. You don't get your spot back. Okay, so that just shows like, please check your emails. I want you all to stay on the wait list. I want you all to stay, you know, moving forward. So that's how that works. Hopefully this makes sense. Any questions about the wait list? Okay. Now, our dental facility, it actually houses three different dental programs, and it's one of the nicest facilities in the country. We just had a $5.5 million renovation to our clinic, and it's actually nicer than my dentist's office right now. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, we have 28 operatories. It's shared with the hygienists, the assistants, and the dental lab techs, which is the third dental program that we offer here that Didi's gonna talk about. Um, they work all in conjunction with each other, which is really realistic. And pretty soon we're gonna have some dentists entering our facility too, to do their uh, dental residencies to become full-on dentists. And, and uh, that's gonna be pretty excited, exciting. We'll be the only place in the country where we have all of those going on. 
So I'm gonna let Didi talk to you a little bit about what dental lab technology is. Uh -huh. Sure. Yes. Okay, good question. So what's the difference between upgrading your seat and being an alternate, right? Upgrading your seat just means I wanna move up if there's a seat in the next bucket, I, I do wanna keep moving up to, to start as soon as possible. An alternate, only the students in the group right before the group that's about to start really are going to be tapped to be an alternate. That, those people, are, think of them like the understudies. We'll take a group of about 10 students from the following group to go through the mandatory orientation, to get their background checks done, to get their vaccinations checked, all of the stuff that the students who are on the roster to start, we have the, the uh, alternates also do all of that stuff because inevitably there are students that are supposed to be on that roster that at the last minute are not able to get in. The schedule is too too difficult, or they. Well, it's it's whichever group is coming up. So yeah, it will always continue to rotate. But yeah, typically we look at the first like fifteen people, because not everybody wants to upgrade. There are some people that say I don't want to move up. I'm planning my life around starting in 2022. And why do you suppose that they would do that? The schedule requirement for dental hygiene, we need you to be about 40 hours a week dedicated to the program. That's a full-time job, which means that our students need to be financially able to spend 40 hours a week. That entails getting childcare in some cases, making sure that they're supported financially. So sometimes moving up is not realistic for some people. They're like, no, I'm saving money. Um, we're arranging our finances in our household so that I can start here and I can't move up. So then we just go to the next person down. Good question. Any other questions about hygiene or the wait list? <clears throat> okay, we're gonna move forward to dental uh, lab tech. I'm not going to put it on because last time I broke it. Can we change it for Just really quick to just go back on what Christy was saying on dental assistant. That is like a full time, also like a full time job. You are at the campus during the day, Monday through Thursday, for the dental assisting. Before I get into this, I just thought about that when she was talking. So that's important to know because you'd have to be here Monday through Thursday. You could still work nights or weekends on that program. So the dental lab technology, there's only 13 of these programs in the United States, and Pima has one. We have students coming from all different states to come and do all this program. We actually had a guy that who's graduating this fall from Hawaii that he came to do the program here, and now he's, gonna, he's, he's doing his last classes this summer, and he's going back home, and he's going to open up his own shop and do this. So what does, what does a dental lab tech do? So a dental lab tech is the person that um, uses um, a patient's impressions or modes, and they, they create the crowns, the dentures, the bridges, the dental um, um, appliances. That's what the dental lab does. They don't have a lot of uh, um, contact with patients. It's more behind the scenes. And it's kind of, all, it's a mix. It says they're a mix of science and art. It is, because you're using science and art, so you're kind of creating these um, these molds, or not the molds, but the crowns and the, the dentures. Um, this program runs here at the West Campus. It is um, a two-year program, so it is a degree. It's an Associates of Science degree. Um, it does start in fall. They only take eight students for this program. So every fall, just eight students for this program. Um, that is the money, around the money that you would make here in Tucson, um, about 3,500 for this program. I mean, thousand, yeah. <laughs> You're like, forget it, I'm not doing it. <laughs> thousand. I'm here with Rita, yeah, 35,000, yeah. Um, added another zero to that, yes. Um, does anybody have questions on this? Any questions? So if this is something that even you want more information, um, make sure that you get with me and Christina and we could help you get into this fall, okay? Um, so we have uh, Tamara here who 
can speak to a number of different programs that we have here, the CTD programs, and I'm going to pass it over to her. There you go. <laughs> Hi everyone, greetings from Desert Vista Campus. I'm Tamara Nicolosi, um, the Advanced Program Manager for the Center for Training and Development. And we have several um, health-related um, programs out at Desert Vista. So I will, um, I will cover those quickly for you. And um, prime, so you'll see online when you go to the page about the Center for Training and Development that all of these programs require an information session. Like Anel said, we love our information sessions. But if you are here today, this counts as your information session for the Center for Training and Development. But you need to see me before you leave so I can sign a verification that you were here today. Um, so if you're interested in any of the programs I'm talking about, come see me before you leave. Um, even if you think you might be interested, because that will save you some time from um, attending another information session. So the first one, um, I don't know if you want to, yeah, we can just, we'll jump in. Um, so our medical office programs, since you're all interested in, in medicine um, to some extent or health-related professions, the medical office program really helps you work in the front of a medical office, um, supporting um, patients as they come in, checking them into the office, um, understanding some things about the electronic medical records, helping the physicians and the doctors and the nurses um, make sure that records are complete and compliant, um, and really being that frontline support for um, medical office. Um, we do um, starts quarterly for this program. So there's one starting July 8th, which may be a little close for you to get jump into that one, but then we're hoping to start again on, I believe it's October 14th is the next start for medical office. So you could just kind of count on a quarterly start um, for these programs. Um, the next, I don't know if we want to jump into a medical assisting. And I'm okay if you want to use the um, PowerPoint that you all use for it because it has the nice information. Okay, um, medical assisting. Um, a medical assistant is you walk into the doctor's office and you get called back to the back. You might, oh, actually the person sitting up front might be a medical assistant, but also the person that greets you and calls your name usually, um, it takes you back into the office and takes your vitals and um, gives you those great immunizations and maybe takes your blood and sets up the room for the doctor. It's really the doctor's right-hand person who helps support that exam. Um, so a medical assistance, a medical assistance right now are in really high demand in Tucson. I just met with an employer a few weeks ago um, that um, said that they're really becoming um, used to be in a doctor's offices they had maybe a, a registered nurse that works right right beside the doctor and now it's a medical assistant um, so more and more um, doctor's offices are needing more and more medical assistants and they're kind of um, stealing them from each other because there aren't enough in Tucson so this is a great career to get into um, it looks like the salary range on here is 33k that actually to me looks a little low um, if you know anything about supply and demand, as um, demand for a skill increases and um, you don't have enough people doing that, uh, wages increase. Um, so that is actually a, a slightly low um, because our graduates are making more than that out in the field full time. Uh, we have multiple start times. Um, so again, this program starts quarterly. Um, generally, there's no wait list. Um, so if you're interested in being a, becoming a medical assistant, our next start is July 8th. I believe there's still room in that cohort. Um, I'll, you're going to see me before you leave. I can um, give you um, the information that you need to get started. All right, so let's look at um, phlebotomy. Um, so our phlebotomy program is one semester. Um, again, it's a certificate program. Um, You'll see that it, the, probably that wage is probably pretty spot on, maybe slightly low, but it's probably, that's probably about what you would make starting out. We have great employee partners in all of these programs um, that we partner with to get you out into the field, working in the doctor's offices, working in the hospitals while you're going through the program at the, or at the end of the program. Um, so you'll have great experience and be ready to jump right into the field. So phlebotomist, um, I, does anyone know what a phlebotomist does? Draws blood. Draws blood. Absolutely. A phlebotomist draws, draws your blood. 
Um, and they become very good at it. So you want a well-skilled phlebotomist by your side if you um, need your blood drawn. So um, this is the person, a lot of times they'll work in a doctor's office, sometimes at uh, hospitals. Um, there's a lots of different places, labs um, here in town. There's lots of labs that you could work in and phlebotomists are always in demand. Um, and again, um, I'll give you, if you're interested, I will get you a paper so you'll know your next steps and um, you can be ready to go. Um, oh, their next start is in September. Um, so you would start in September and be done December, January timeframe with your externship and your, inter your um, time out in the field. All right, Surge Tech. Dr. Gall, do you want to speak to this or would you like? I can. <laughs> All right, I will pass the microphone off to Dr. Gall, but Surge Tech is a CTD program. So if you're interested, come see me before you leave today so I can sign your paper and give you your next steps. Thank you. Morning, everybody. How are you? Are you, are you tolerating this all right? I know it's a lot of information to be talking about. So my name is Joseph Gaw. I am the academic dean for what is known as, as critical care here at Pima Community College. So that is nursing, respiratory therapy, surgical technology, and rad technology. Uh, the surgical tech program is probably uh, one of the biggest growing areas in Tucson right now. Uh, if you're not aware, there are several new hospitals going in. There's new surgical areas going in. Uh, and if you have any kind of an OR, you need a surgical technologist. These guys are in charge of the OR. You would think that the surgeons were, but actually these guys are the ones who like rule the school pertaining to the, uh, to the OR environment. They are the ones that are protecting patient care at all times. They are watching for sterility. They're watching for the, the breakage of sterility. And they also know all the instrumentation. And believe it or not, they actually know the procedure just as well as the surgeon does, because they have to be able to to, to anticipate that next step all the time. Uh, so if you're a person who likes people, or as our director of our program says, I like people, but I like the things that's on the inside more, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, she, she loves the OR. She is a, 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 a huge industry leader in the OR. Okay, and she is a champion of the best practices out there in all of Tucson. In addition, uh, she is employed still. She, she goes all over the world and actually texts for surgeons all across borders. Okay, so phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal woman. It is a one year program right now, okay. It, is, it, it leads to a, a certificate. Uh, the industry is moving it towards a two-year degree. We're going to be the only uh, school that's going to have a two-year surgical technology degree with a baccalaureate component attached to it. Uh, so if you're thinking surge tech long term, this is the place that you should plan to come because we have the highest technology. We are growing that program tremendously. Uh, the, the employability is huge in Tucson, and it's what we call get in, get trained, get out and work rapidly, right? Uh, we have a competitive application process, so how that works is that you're going to apply uh, if you meet the, the, the minimal standards, uh, Leanne will call you in for a one-on-one -on -one or a team-to-one job interview type of a thing, okay? And she is after that person who, who is connected 
in that field because this program has a lot of interest, a lot of interest. Uh, she currently starts in the spring and the fall now. We have two cohorts up, uh, that move through each year. It is stationed at the, the Desert Vista campus at this particular time. The long-term plan is to move it over here, okay? Uh, that salary range is a bit low. It's actually climbing up because as you can guess, the more demand you have, the higher the salaries are gonna go. And the higher education that you have, the more income you bring. Uh, just so that you're aware, the median income of a master's prepared healthcare professional in Tucson is 55,000 a year. Many of these programs that you see, if you put the time and effort into it, you'll actually exceed that with an associate's degree or less, okay? Um, is there anything else that you think they should know about surgical technology? What's an OR? OR, operating room, sorry. I'm <laughs> so anytime that you need a procedure, maybe like uh, from anything from some, so cataract repair in the eyes, basic so like outpatient type stuff to wide open heart surgery hip replacements, you name it. They do it in a sterile environment. That person, the surgical tech is in charge of that whole environment. They protect patients. They are your, your hidden patient advocate, which you would think the OR nurse was, but it's actually these guys who are in charge. Really, really cool field to be in. Is there any other program that, that you need, need to talk about? Um, no, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I want to welcome you, and I'm sorry I was a bit late. Um, congratulations on taking the very first step. This is a huge, a huge crucial step to figuring out what pathway you want to go. You have made an excellent choice here at Pima Community College. We have the lowest cost, best outcomes, and pathways to baccalaureate and master's pathways better than anybody else. So we are here to, to serve you. We are here to also help you to achieve that goal. And remember that you belong here at Pima Community College. As an alumni, you are highly I'm taught after, I'm talking about 100% higher rates usually, okay? We also have the highest pass rates as well. Also, you can do this. You can do this here at Pima Community College. We have small class sizes. We have instructors who know who you are and they, and they are there along that entire path with you. We are here to help you be highly successful um, healthcare professionals here in Tucson because we certainly definitely need it. Thank you very much. Do you want to do radiology too? Sure. Yeah, I know <laughs> We're going to do radiology as well. So radiology is a two-year program. Uh, it is held here at the West Campus. Uh, we have multiple high-tech labs here on our campus. We do all of your training here and in the clinical environment throughout Tucson, okay? Uh, it is a, have, have you talked about the baccalaureate components to some of these programs? Okay, so the programs that are in my division are all nationally accredited, which means that you get the best of quality, number two, they are linked to a baccalaureate pathway or a master's pathway, which that means is you get to complete your bachelor's and your associate degree at the exact same time for half the cost. For instance, this particular program, you can kind of 
target around between twenty-three to twenty-seven thousand dollars for the entire baccalaureate and two-year pathway. Whereas if you go to the universities, that's going to be like three times as much, right? You get the same quality here. So you can complete up to 90 credits with Northern or here at Pima Co uh, College that will transfer to Northern Arizona University. So they're going to take 90 credits of Pima courses, which benefits you because you get so the very low cost price at Pima College. Then that you're going to complete 30 credits, which is 10 courses with Northern Arizona University, and you now have a baccalaureate degree. Okay, you do that at the same time. So, or while that you're waiting to get into the program, you can begin taking baccalaure baccalaureate classes to knock those things out, so that you're not stalling time there. Okay. You will walk out of our program with a, a, a two-year associate degree in as a radiologic technician, which means that you may enter the field taking x-rays uh, and doing the basic procedures of that. That leads to higher stackable, uh, stackable credentialing, like CAT scan technician the MRI technicians, ultrasound technicians. Uh, if that you are not aware, this field is also a, a hugely growing area. It is now common practice in parts of our world to, to image in holographic technology. So if I'm a surgeon in the OR with my <coughs> surgical technologist alongside of me, right, I can now project the person's organ holographically right over to the OR table and I can enlarge it, manipulate it that way, right? These guys are going to be the experts on how, how to create that image. So how that works is that you like technology, you like sciences, you like people, you like creating images, it's very, believe it or not, there is all kinds of art added into this, okay? And the students who do this absolutely love the field. They stay in it for very, very long periods of time. In addition, this, uh, the salary range is also a bit low as well right now, uh, um, but we only bring you in one time a year. And you typically start in the summertime. So you're gonna take a lab component before the actual classes start up. In addition, uh, there is a wait list at this point for this particular program. The wait list is approximately three years on paper, but that's not how it really is. It's about a year and a half-ish. But you could be taking baccalaureate courses while that you're hanging in there, all right? And they are now growing as well in size, so you can expect that, that, that the wait list will move along like even faster. Um, the future of this program is maybe ultrasound technology as well on this campus. We're building these big, major, major programs moving forward. Uh, so key component to this, you can earn a baccalaureate degree and your two year at the same time. Half the cost, half the time. Any other things that you need you can talk about, Rad? Not even respiratory therapy, which you don't need. I'll do respiratory therapy. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, if, if you are, sorry, I'm going to plug this. If you need rapid entry training into health professions, I'm talking about five weeks of training. That's it. Get out there and start working, taking care of patients immediately. We do offer a nurse aid program 
which does lead to all these other programs as well. If you're not aware, the healthcare industry has moved from a, a volume-based industry, get patients through as fast as possible, fill those beds, right, to a quality healthcare system. So it's about patient care, satisfaction, uh, being able to address people individually, not as the patient, right? So with that being said, the industry has been asking for basic nursing knowledge. That is in the nurse aid course components. In addition, when these programs go from wait listing to, to a competitive application process, certified and licensed personnel will get points on these actual rubrics to come in faster. Nurse aid counts towards those things. You can do all that in five weeks. If that you're interested in that, uh, you'll hand them Carol's contact. Okay, thank you. And we have the sign-in sheets that Tamara can sign. Yeah. And we have them back there with Tamara too. So that is a CTD program currently. So it, I have, I actually brought those with me. So Excellent. it will be all your next steps. Thank you, Tamara. That is rapid entry, quick, not that expensive, and you get out. And guess what? You're employable in healthcare right away. And there is a, I think the last I saw was like a 30% need increase here in Tucson alone. There are jobs and there are choices of jobs. Okay? All right. Is there anything else? Well, thank you very much. Good luck. And thank you for spending your morning here with us. We appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna hop into the uh, respiratory therapy program. Um, I don't know if you overheard me, one of my favorite programs. Does anybody in here know what a respiratory therapist does? What is the respiratory system? What was it? Breathe. Breathing, exactly. These are the people that keep you breathing, right? <laughs> so, um, a respiratory therapist, they can work in a number of different places. In the hospital, it's a huge employer of respiratory therapists. They work right alongside nurses. In fact, a lot of times the person that you see walking around the hospital that you think is a nurse is actually a respiratory therapist. It's a, it's a huge uh, component of the hospital setting. Um, reason being, what's the number one most important function of the human body to keep somebody alive? you have to be breathing. You can be brain dead and still be alive. If you're not breathing, that's it, right? So um, there are times that respiratory therapists need to put people on ventilators. Um, when, when a person goes into a coma or into an induced coma, those, uh, the life support machines that keep them breathing, those are respiratory therapists that do those. Nobody else touches those machines but a respiratory therapist. Um, taking people off life support, likewise, that's going to be a respiratory therapist. Um, on the other side of the house, in the clinical setting, respiratory therapists can teach people how to use their inhalers, right? In children with asthma, or they can even work in sleep studies, because sleep apnea, that's a breathing issue. So there's a lot of different applications of going into respiratory therapy. It's one of those jobs that's everywhere and people don't even realize that it's everywhere. It's kind of a hidden occupation. Um, there is a huge demand for respiratory therapists uh, in the Tucson area and uh, nationally. They make very good money. Um, we just had a graduating class. Banner came in to one of our graduating classes and hired 10 of our students starting at 50,000, which is, you know, for a two-year degree, that's, that's, a, that's a great place to start. And Banner has excellent um, benefits, um, healthcare benefits and all kinds of benefits, right? So the program itself, once you get into the program, it's two years. But like radiology and like dental hygiene, there are prerequisite classes that have to get done before you can apply. Um, respiratory therapist, th therapy, we're just looking for a couple of basics. If you bring me or Didi your transcripts, we will tell you what you need and if we can substitute anything in. Our goal is to get you into these programs and out of them as quickly as possible. So if we can find a substitution, 100%, I mean, you can ask Dr. Gott, we push for it. We push and push and push. We're student advocates. So um, 
The program of respiratory therapy does have the 90-30 with NAU, which allows you to do um, NAU, uh, the bachelor simultaneously uh, with the associates. Um, we do start every fall. And this fall, we're all filled up. We're still accepting applications for fall of 2020. Um, in the meantime, while you're on the wait list, you are more than welcome to work on those baccalaureate online classes through NAU so that you're not doing nothing. Or you can work on some of the general education classes that are attached uh, to respiratory therapy. Um, let's see. It's here at the West Campus. We have a fabulous uh, clinical setting here. In these programs, you do lecture, where it's kind of like this, we're teaching you like this. You do lab, where we take you to the classroom next door and we teach you some hands-on stuff with the equipment. And then you have clinic. Clinic is where we get you out of the campus and you're out at a hospital somewhere doing your, uh, your hospital rounds or clinical rounds, if it's a clinic or a doctor's office, right? So um, any questions about respiratory therapy? Mm -hmm. Hold up, sorry. <laughs> so the estimated cost. I want to do, rather than going over the cost of each program, because I genuinely do not have them memorized, I want to talk to you guys about how tuition is calculated for these programs. I'm going to briefly step into that. Didi, I brought um, up on the top, there's already a tuition screen. OK, so on the Pima website, there's this tuition screen, right? If you scroll to the very bottom of the screen, all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way. Keep going, keep going. Okay, right here. You see how right here it has differential tuition A and differential tuition B? These are footnotes that no other students have to pay attention to. Well, some other students, but mainly healthcare students, right? Let me move this. Hopefully you all can see this now. So when you're looking up the tuition for your program, you're gonna wanna find where it falls. Dental hygiene, for example, falls under differential tuition B. Respiratory therapy, therapeutic massage, radiologic technology, pharmacy, medical lab tech, a lot of the other ones fall under differential tuition A. So if Didi, if you can scroll all the way up to the top, just pull that browser up. So when you estimate the cost of the credits, there are general education credits in a program, and then there are the core classes, right? The general education classes are all gonna be regular general tuition. So it's like if you have a writing class that you need to take, great, that's three credits. That class is gonna be 253, right? But once you get in, let's say that you're doing dental hygiene, your first dental hygiene class. Well, dental hygiene, the first semester is 15 credits. So Didi, if you can scroll down to the 15 credit. Okay, when you're calculating, nope, nope, too high, I can't reach, okay. <laughs> when you're calculating the tuition for the first semester of dental hygiene, you'll go, okay, here's the general tuition, plus, it was under differential B, right? So you do this plus this for that semester's cost, for the 15 credits of that semester. Because those hygiene, the core classes, are at a higher tuition rate than the general classes. So when you go onto your program websites, and you see, we have it all break, broken down into the general credits and into the actual core credits. You guys need to calculate your tuition, right? That, um, we're not the money people, right? We're the academic people. So literally, if you ask us what your tuition is, we're gonna do exactly this. We're gonna go on the website and be like, well, how many credits are in dental hygiene? And then we're gonna come and we're gonna do this chart. So you can do this for yourself. You can be empowered to look up the tuition of multiple programs and just kind of see where that falls. Um, I don't know how much respiratory is. I'm guessing that it's, what do you think? Maybe like 11,000 for, for, all, for all of it? You think including prerequisites and stuff? Yeah, probably right. Maybe 13. Yeah, so uh, we can calculate it and we'll kind of see how that falls. I'll tell you what, we're definitely gonna be by far the least expensive program in Arizona, or in, at least in Southern Arizona. Um, our next competitors are about four times our cost. Three times our cost, four times our cost. Those are the private schools, right? And we outrank them, so just saying. <laughs> um, so if we go over, back over to the, to the, the 
presentation, I really want to highly recommend that you guys check out respiratory therapy. And I just want to do a plug about the wait list also, and then I'll get to your question. Yeah, so um, during the wait list periods in radiology, respiratory, or dental hygiene, for, especially for radiology and respiratory, I highly encourage you to do the five-week CNA training. They are looking for people to have some basic nurse aid care in both of these, so that's five weeks. There are other things that you can do on the wait list. You can work on those bachelor level courses. If you already have a bachelor's degree, then great. But I'll tell you what, that the industry for respiratory therapy is doing the same thing that nursing is doing. Nurse used to be just great, get your associates, you're an RN, right? Sit for your boards, now you're an RN. Now, what are they asking nurses to have? The BSN, the Bachelor of Science in Nursing. It's elevated, just like it did with occupational therapy, and physical therapy assistant. Those all used to be two-year programs, but then they kind of start moving them <coughs> towards higher educational needs. Respiratory right now is doing the same thing. By 2025, they want all new, the schools offering those programs have to have a baccalaureate partner in order to offer respiratory therapy, which means that if you go into this field, after a while, your competition in the job market, they're gonna have their bachelor's degrees. All the new people, you might have more experience, but those new people coming in, they will have their bachelor's degrees. So I highly recommend for respiratory because we already know that that date has been set, do the bachelor's degree. Go ahead. Those are actually completed online. So the NAU courses are 100% online. We do not send you to Flagstaff, um, and they're not here on campus. They're online. Now those classes are gonna cover really hospital administration, ethics, um, privacy, things like that. You do not have to have your hands-on training in radiology, respiratory, to do those classes. So it's fine to move that junior and senior year in front <coughs> of that freshman, sophomore year. And those are college rates or NAU? Oh, that's a good question. NAU rates. Yeah. So when you're doing the NAU courses, you're an NAU student during those semesters. So you're, you might be on the wait list with us, but while you're taking those 10 online NAU classes, you're paying NAU's tuition for online courses, which is still the lowest state school cost. Okay. And what was your question? Uh, Yeah, and next fall, 2020, is getting filled up. So if you are looking at snagging a seat in the fall of 2020, come see us as soon as possible. We'll see how quickly we can get you applied um, because I think it's, it's getting up there. I mean, we'll always lose people also, you know, as, as time goes on, but yeah, good question. Any other questions about respiratory therapy? Okay, yeah? classes, 30 credits, yeah. That's why we call it the 90-30. You do 90 credits here at Pima, you do 30 with NAU. Dental hygiene has a similar um, arrangement with NAU, but they do not let you start the baccalaureate courses while you're on the wait list. Those have to be done either once you've started dental hygiene or once you've graduated from dental hygiene, but you can't do it while on the wait list. To hygiene, no. Mm -mm. yeah. No. But you wouldn't need to do an additional bachelor's in hygiene if you already have a bachelor's. You're good. Oh. Yeah. They don't care what the bachelor's is in. Can I? Clinical research. You would already, you would already be that next step. Mm -hmm. I already yeah. yeah. So just, oh, just cool. so you know, that is where a lot of us come from, is public health. That's my background. And then we go into clinical research. Which way do we do it? I have background. Oh, that's cool. I'm yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I heard that. that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, dental hygiene. They haven't like thrown down. You know, they haven't like thrown it in and been like, you need bachelor's degrees now. It's, it hasn't. That's not really happening yet for dental hygiene. The fact that you even have a bachelor's degree will be great. It'll be more than what they're even looking for. Respiratory. They want the bachelor's in respiratory. Not just any bachelor's, it needs to be a respiratory bachelor's degree. 
radiology they have not said that it's going to be required but i would not be surprised if in the next five years that comes down and so, and they start talking about bachelor's degrees for radiology being required okay so we're going to move forward into the pharmacy um, tech program we had a few people signed in for pharmacy so here to speak on that program is Ms. Don Majalka. I'll have to hold both. Maybe, maybe if I don't lose it. Okay, hi, I'm Don Majalka. I'm the clinical coordinator for pharmacy technology. I actually have a little cheat sheet too, like Rita did, so I don't forget anything. Um, when you guys think about pharmacy technology, what do you guys think about? So we actually work as pharmacy technicians. Even though the program's called pharmacy technology, we're a pharmacy technician. You think we count pills all day, right? <laughs> That's not what we really do. So more than anything, we are there to assist the pharmacist, starting from reading prescriptions, filling the prescriptions, and giving them to the patients. This may include calling insurance companies, calling the doctor, calling the patient to clarify things. There's a lot of different things that we actually do. Um, we also will be seen doing fixing things in the pharmacy, <laughs> making things, make sure nothing's expired, nothing like that. Um, where do you think we work? Do you think we only work retail? No. So retail would be your main big chains here in town. There's also pharmacies in your hospital. Every hospital has a pharmacy. They may not be open 24 seven, but they all have pharmacies. You have, um, especially here, we have a extended care facilities that have pharmacies in them. We have compounding pharmacies. We have mail order pharmacies. So if you're not good with patients and dealing with the public, mail order pharmacy is a great pathway for you because you're behind closed doors, you're just counting the pills. That's kind of what that job is, even though you're going through all the training. Our job market, just like any healthcare industry, we are growing, we're expanding. They're estimating, a, it's not on here, about 12% right now. It's probably a little bit higher now. Our money, so, Look at 34,000 starting, I'd say it goes about 34 to 45 starting, just depending on where you are and if you wanna do retail or hospital. There's different pay grades in those. Also, it will decide on once you complete your degree, you actually have to sit for the national board and you'll get a different license from the State Board of Pharmacy once you do that and you move up from a Tech 1 to a Tech 2, which increases your pay. Okay, so our program, we're a certificate program. Um, there are a few things on the website that may be wrong that say associate's degree. The associate, associate's degree is not active at this time. We are doing the certificate program and it takes about one year to complete all of the pharmacy courses. Okay, that summer, spring, summer, fall, spring. You can start any of those semesters. You don't have to wait, okay? Actually, we, that's not fair. That's huh? Old. Yeah, that's so old. this two, the one-year program is active. The two-year program is not active at this point in time. The Associates of Applied Sciences is not. We're also at Northwest now. It's yes. Sorry. I don't know why I So, <laughs> so we have, we've done a lot of changes in the last year to the program. Yeah. We've moved from East Campus down to Northwest Campus, so it's, pretty convenient to get to. East Campus, if you're not on that side of town, it's not always that convenient to get to, I know that. Um, we do have a mainly <coughs> online program. I would say 80% of it's online. You do have two courses that you will have to come to campus for. They're lab courses. They're actually hybrids if you've ever taken any Pima courses. So you do the coursework online and then you come to the lab. The One's a sterile compounding lab and one's a non-sterile compounding lab. The non-sterile is on Tuesdays from about 12.45 to 3.45 and the sterile is on Thursdays from 5.45 to 8.45 in the evening. 
So these you don't have to take in the same semester. They can be taken separate semesters. You can work out how it's going to work with your schedule. The nice thing about being online, a lot of our students work full time or stay at home with their kids. And when they have labs, they're able to switch out with somebody to watch their children. So anybody have any questions at this point? I'll keep. <laughs> um, for getting in, we do have a couple assessments that do have to be taken or you have to pass math 92 or reading 91. And then we have a selective admissions process that you have to go through. And you just have to contact the program director, Susie, and we can get you working into the program. We can start you this fall. Once you are actually completed in this program, you will sit for the national board, which I discussed. It's called PTCB, Pharmacy Technician Certification Board. You'll get your national certification. In order to sit for that, Come 2020, you will have to go through an accredited, a ASHP accredited program, which we are one. There are a few in town now, but we're one of the few. And then you will also have to have, that's all you'll have to have for that. But then for your state board license, you will have to have a criminal background check. Okay? Any questions? No? We're good? Good. Yeah, I'll program. stay around. Yeah. yeah. It's a one, remember, it's a one year program. This, it's a one year program. So this can nestle really nicely into a wait list, right? <clears throat> you want to always stack your credentials. That's what makes you more employable. Um, Didi is going to go ahead and take over now. Okay. The next program is health information technology. Um, so, what does a health information technician do? Um, they organize and um, maintain health information data with hospitals, um, doctors, um, health facilities. Um, they ensure that um, the information maintains accuracy and um, accessibility and quality and security. So this is actually really like a high demand area right now with hospitals and doctors areas. Um, it is a two-year program. It is all online. So if you already work a job, you could actually um, do this as well. Um, the pay, I think, is a little low here. I think it's a little bit higher than that in, in Tucson. Um, so Tucson, I know, that is seeking this. The good thing about this program, there is a built-in um, certificate that you can do as well. So a medical billing and coding certificate, um, which you can, um, it's about 33 credits. You can do in probably a year, depending on how many, uh, how many um, credits you take um, that will build right into this. And medical building and coding is much needed right now. Um, I know that there, um, some of the health facilities are hiring people out of state from home long distance doing this because we, we can't, they can't produce enough medical and building um, coding um, uh, uh, people to work in this area. So. Um, this one um, starts multiple times. So it's summer, spring, and fall. Um, it, um, like I said, it's online, so it's really flexible. Does anybody have any questions on this program? It's a really growing program, because you know, with the data being stolen, um, this is a huge program um, that is very employable in high demand. Yeah, a lot of people look at this credential and stack it up with one of the IT credentials in cybersecurity. And cybersecurity specifically for hospitals because hackers keep like hacking hospital files and then holding that data ransom. I don't know if you guys hear about this or follow it. So they really need um, cybersecurity technicians that understand how health records are managed and maintained. Um, so kind of a cool way to bridge those two. So I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about medical lab technology, which is a super cool program that I didn't even know existed. So um, there's medical, medical lab tech. So I want you to picture this. You go to the doctor. First of all, 
your medical assistant signs you in, takes your vitals, weighs you, and asks you, why are you here? What, what, what are you experiencing? Writes it all down on your file, right? Hands that file over to your <coughs> physician. Your physician, as soon as she reads the file, she's gonna be like, okay, I know what this patient is here for. Go ahead and perform the exam, kind of hear what's going on. And then a lot of times if you're like, you know, I'm experiencing a lot of fatigue, or like my stomach has just been cramping for a month or something, you know, whatever it is. And she's gonna say, you know what, let's run some labs, right? So then you go out and either a phlebotomist <coughs> or a medical assistant are gonna draw your blood, right? Where does that blood go? <laughs> the blood goes to the medical lab technician. This person, um, hospitals have, uh, employ hundreds of, of, of medical lab techs. Um, they also work in labs because a lot of doctor's offices don't have their own lab facilities, so they outsource that. They will send the blood over to like a Sonora Quest or something to run these tests. So they receive these, these samples. It could be a tissue sample, it could be saliva, it could be urine, it can be blood, whatever. They're receiving samples. <coughs> they are running tests on these different uh, tissues. So they can test for things like um, disease. They can test for allergies. Uh, they can test for vitamin deficiencies. They can test for cancer. They can test for so many different things. They put all of that into a lab report, which is then sent back to your physician so she can be like, oh my gosh, you, you're just deficient in vitamin D or something like that, right? And prescribe you whatever treatment plan would be necessary moving forward. So these people, um, don't really face the patient as often. Although we do in this program teach phlebotomy, there is blood drawing that we teach. Really in the field, they're not doing phlebotomy. They are just testing those specimens. They make really good <coughs> money, guys. So if you haven't considered this as, um, as a career, you should definitely consider it. They're, they're starting easily in the 50s here in the Tucson area, and it's only a two-year program. So, um, there's tons of jobs out there. We have no problem with our, our placement of jobs. And um, they have to take a board exam at the end to become certified. And we have like in the 90s as far as our pass rates on those board exams. So highly, highly recommend that you check this out. Yeah, this salary range up here, it's, it's higher than that. We've already exceeded that here in the Tucson area. We're, we're in, at least in the 50s, in the, in the mid 50s now for this. Now, um, maybe you guys hadn't considered this before, but if it piques your interest, let me know if you have any questions because I'm happy to go over this program with you. We, uh, we only take eight students at a time. So um, what happens is a lot of U of A people go to U of A, they study microbiology. Why would you study microbiology, right? because you want to work in a lab, but they don't realize that if you're not certified, you cannot work in a lab. So they'll graduate with their bachelor's degrees in microbiology, try to go out into the field, they can't get work. They have to come back and get certified. So a lot of our seats are kind of, U of A students are trying to grab them up, but we will always look for homegrown Pima students to offer those seats to. Okay, any questions? We're gonna move forward. Okay, Dee Dee. almost done. So therapeutic massage therapy, um, that's a term that um, describes like different um, massage modalities. So it, um, for chronic pain, um, it reduces stress, um, healing, relaxation. It's a technique that you use, which I'm sure you guys have all had a massage, right? And if you haven't, you gotta go get one. <laughs> um, this, this program starts in fall and spring. Um, it's at the Northwest campus. Um, it is a two-year program, so you actually get a degree when you're done with this. Um, I believe that is the going rate for salary. So you can work for a spa, you can work on a, a cruise ship, um, you can work with athletes, you can work with babies, um, doing different um, modalities, just to kind of depending on what area you want to focus on. Um, so with this program, actually, you don't have to go sit for state licensure. You would actually, because of our um, accreditation, you'd be able to just to go to work. You could also work for yourself, too, with this program. Um, any questions on, on this program? <coughs> Pima, 
Pima Community College actually, if you are a student, you can actually get a massage at the Northwest campus for $10. So if you haven't had a massage, or even if you had, you, you might wanna look into that. For $10, it's well worth it. This is it, and then we're gonna to talk to you about your next steps very briefly, it's pretty simple. So veteran, uh, a veterinary technology, those also fall under us as your health advisors. So those of you who like to work with animals, we offer a vet tech program as well as a vet assistant program, and we house this program out of our East Campus, that's where we keep our domestics. So these are the people that are going to be the nurses for the animals, think a nurse, but for animals, right? So it is a rigorous program. You're learning the anatomy and physiology of many species. And um, typically, when people bring in their pets, um, the first person to see that, to see that uh, client or that patient uh, would be the vet tech or the vet assistant. Um, vet assistants, a lot of times, are up at the front kind of checking people in. Vet tech will go in, take the vitals of the animal, just like, just, just like a nurse would, right? And then the uh, veterinarian would be the one to uh, prescribe whatever treatment or medicine is needed. That said, a lot of times it's the vet tech that administers the medicine. Um, so um, we have a wonderful program. We cover um, exotics, we cover do domestics. We also get into the larger animals, bovine, uh, equine, goats. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, we, cover, we cover all of them, right? So you can kind of take it out goats. <laughs> yeah, goats are awesome. So you can kind of go anywhere with this. Um, you could work at places like the, uh, that, 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 uh, the Sonoran Desert Museum kind of place. We have students working there. We have students working at the zoo. So many cool things you could do with this. So if any of you have an interest or have a friend with an interest, let us know. We will explain how to get into this program. Um, all of these programs, except health information technology, have special applications that must be submitted in order for you to get in, okay? So let's talk about what your next steps are gonna be. Briefly, I want to explain to you what, where you start. Here at Pima, there are two types of advisors. We have our general enrollment advisors, and then we have program advisors, okay? Didi and I are program advisors. Now, before you come and see Didi and I, there are some things that need to be done. You need to have these things done or we can't properly advise you. You're gonna work with the general advising staff, the admissions, right, at enrollment advising staff to get the following done. You need to have your assessments taken or you need to take your assessment tests. If you've graduated high school or gotten your GED within the last three years and your GPA in your high school was over a, a 3.0 or higher, you can bring those transcripts in to any advisor and use those in lieu of taking um, an assessment exam. On most programs. On, huh? On most programs. On most programs, not the CTD ones, <laughs> FYI. So, <laughs> and you heard it here, not CTD. <laughs> so, um, that needs to be done. We cannot place you into courses if you do not have valid assessments on file. Some assessments expire after three years. So if you took your math assessment a long time ago and you didn't take a math class recently, you probably need to do your math assessment again. So if you're like, well, how do I know? You need to see a general advisor, have them look at your file and tell you. If you applied for Pima more than a year ago and you have not taken classes, your application is probably inactive, okay? Which means that you need to get your application with Pima reactivated. Our general advising staff can help you with that. You need to make sure that your residency is up to date, that you're showing is in-state or out-of-state or whatever you need to be. If you have any holds on your account, you need to resolve those holds with the general advising staff, right? Those are all things that we need you to have done so that we can help you when you get to us. Didi and I are here for your programmatic advising. So that means you're here, you see us when it's a program-specific question, right? Program-specific question would be like, how do I apply? into dental hygiene. Well, for us to answer that question, we're gonna to need to look over your record. What do you think we need to see? We need to see your assessments, right? If you have transcripts from other universities or colleges, you need to have those sent into Pima and evaluated. Because if you just tell us, well, I took a math at NAU 
that doesn't do anything for us. We need it to be on your transcript so that we can tell you if it's a valid one and if we can move you forward in the, in the process. So the first thing you're gonna do is make sure that you get those basic preliminary steps completed. Now, in order to schedule time with Didi and I, I actually brought up my um, auto response on there, on the email, okay. So, oh God, that's tiny. Okay, let's ooh, zoom that way in. Okay, when you send Didi or I an email, you're gonna get an automatic response. It's an auto reply, like a vacation setting. setting. Thank you for emailing us, da, da 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 To book an advising appointment, please follow this link. Follow that link. You're gonna click that link. It's gonna take you straight into our actual calendar. And it'll have little gray boxes that you can click on and schedule yourself in. So when you send me an email saying, I'd like to schedule an advising appointment, I'm just gonna say, okay, cool, click the link, right? Go ahead and click the link on the auto response that you got. Apart from that, we also do group advisings. We do those at multiple campuses. So let's say that you're way on the east side and you're like, I really like can't get out to west that often. Take a look at our group advising, follow that link, see when we're gonna be out at east. We can help you out at east. Oh, by the way, for the appointments, we do video advising too. So if you're far away, we can, we can hook up with you uh, video. We don't do phone appointments, okay? Lastly, we have our walk-in hours listed. So you can see I usually put a few weeks out. Um, you can see when we'll have our office hours. Dee Dee has the same thing on hers. And then you can come by. Our office hours are hosted right upstairs at the, um, in the Student Services Center where all those desks are, where all the, the general advisors sit. You just check in up at the reception desk, tell them, I'm here to see Dee Dee. I'm here to see Christina. They will put our names on your sign-in so that we can call you specifically from the line instead of whatever other student is there. We call our students first, right? So that is how you would come see us, right? Um, and so pop quiz, like if you needed to update your residency status, what would you do? Would you see me or Dee Dee? No. Exactly, you'd go to a general advisor at whatever campus is the closest campus to you. You walk on in. What if you have a question about your financial aid? Like is, is my financial aid gonna work for my program? You're gonna see a financial aid advisor for that, right? Um, when you have your assessments and you have your transcripts all in, come see us. If you've already sent your transcripts in and they're just not evaluated yet, bring us a copy of your unofficials. We'll see what we can do. Any questions about how to contact us? Email. So I want to make sure all of you guys get one of those face flyers in the back that have like Didi and mine, like <laughs> our faces, like ah. It has all of our contact information on it. That's the one. That's the one. Um, so it, and also my email is cfolia, c f o g l i a at pima.edu. D D E N O G E A N two at Pima.edu, but it's on there. And we also have a bunch of cards in the back um, and cards for a lot of the directors back there. Any other questions? So your next step, I know a lot of you are gonna have a lot of questions right now. Um, Dee Dee and I have another meeting that we're going to directly after this. So now would not be the best time to come ask us. We have to kind of run. What we want you to do is take a look at the auto response, take a look at the schedule, and then find a time when we're gonna have open office hours to help you. But before you go, if you had an interest in CNA, surgical tech, phlebotomy, medical office programs, medical assisting, you need to see Tamara because she has to sign the permission slip, otherwise they're gonna make you go to another one hour info session, <laughs> okay? Clinical research, you're gonna see Rita. Far oh yeah, pharmacy, you're gonna see Don. And HPOG, you're <laughs> you're gonna see an L. Okay? Phlebotomy? You're gonna see Tamara. Yeah, in the white in the white blazer. Thank you for coming guys. Have a great day. For a spa, you can work on a, a cruise ship. Um, you can work with athletes, you can work with babies, um, doing different um, modalities, just to kind of depending on what area you want to focus on. Um, 
So with this program, actually, you don't have to go sit for a state licensure. You would actually, because of our um, accreditation, you'd be able to just to go to work. You could also work for yourself, too, with this program. Um, any questions on, on this <coughs> Pima Community College, actually, if you are a student, you can actually get a massage at the Northwest campus for $10. So if you haven't had a massage, or even if you had, you, you might want to look into that. For $10, it's well worth it. This is it, and then we're gonna to talk to you about your next steps very briefly, it's pretty simple. So veteran, uh, a veterinary technology, those also fall under us as your health advisors. So those of you who like to work with animals, we offer a vet's tech program as well as a vet assistant program, and we house this program out of our East Campus, that's where we keep our domestics. So these are the people that are going to be the nurses for the animals, think a nurse, but for animals, right? So it is a rigorous program. You're learning the anatomy and physiology of many species. And um, typically, when people bring in their pets, um, the first person to see that, to see that uh, client or that patient uh, would be the vet tech or the vet assistant. Um, vet assistants, a lot of times, are up at the front kind of checking people in. Vet tech will go in, take the vitals of the animal, just like, just, just like a nurse would, right? And then the uh, veterinarian would be the one to uh, prescribe whatever treatment or medicine is needed. That said, a lot of times it's the vet tech that administers the medicine. Um, so um, we have a wonderful program. We cover um, exotics, we cover do domestics. We also get into the larger animals, bovine, uh, equine, goats. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, we, cover, we cover all of them, right? So you can kind of take it out, goats. <laughs> yeah, goats are awesome. So you can kind of go anywhere with this. Um, you could work at places like the uh, that 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 uh, the Sonoran Desert Museum kind of place. We have students working there. We have students working at the zoo. So many cool things you could do with this. So if any of you have an interest or have a friend with an interest, let us know. We will explain how to get into this program. Um, all of these programs, except health information technology have special applications that must be submitted in order for you to get in, okay? So let's talk about what your next steps are gonna be. Briefly, I want to explain to you what, where you start. Here at Pima, there are two types of advisors. We have our general enrollment advisors and then we have program advisors, okay? Didi and I are program advisors. Now, before you come and see Didi and I, there are some things that need to be done. You need to have these things done or we can't properly advise you. You're gonna work with the general advising staff, the admissions, right, at enrollment advising staff to get the following done. You need to have your assessments taken or you need to take your assessment tests. If you've graduated high school or gotten your GED within the last three years and your GPA in your high school was over a 3.0 or higher, you can bring those transcripts in to any advisor and use those in lieu of taking um, an assessment exam. On most programs. On, huh? On most programs. On most programs, not the CTD ones, <laughs> FYI. So, <laughs> and you heard it here, not CTD. <laughs> so, um, that needs to be done. We cannot place you into courses if you do not have valid assessments on file. Some assessments expire after three years. So if you took your math assessment a long time ago and you didn't take a math class recently, you probably need to do your math assessment again. So if you're like, well, how do I know? You need to see a general advisor, have them look at your file and tell you. If you applied for Pima more than a year ago and you have not taken classes, your application is probably inactive, okay? Which means that you need to get your application with Pima reactivated. Our general advising staff can help you with that. You need to make sure that your residency is up to date, that you're showing is in-state or out-of-state or whatever you need to be. If you have any holds on your account, you need to resolve those holds with the general advising staff, right? Those are all things that we need you to have done so that we can help you when you get to us. Didi and I are here for your programmatic advising. So that means you're here, you see us when it's a program-specific question, right? Program-specific question would be like, how do I apply? into dental hygiene. Well, for us to answer that question, we're gonna to need to look over your record. What do you think we need to see? 
we need to see your assessments, right? If you have transcripts from other universities or colleges, you need to have those sent into Pima and evaluated. Because if you just tell us, well, I took a math at NAU, that doesn't do anything for us. We need it to be on your transcript so that we can tell you if it's a valid one and if we can move you forward in the, in the process. So the first thing you're gonna do is make sure that you get those basic preliminary steps completed. Now, in order to schedule time with Didi and I, I actually brought up my um, auto response on there, on the email, okay. So, oh God, that's tiny. Okay, let's mm. ooh, zoom that way in. Okay, when you send Didi or I an email, you're gonna get an automatic response. It's an auto reply, like a vacation setting. setting. Thank you for emailing us, da, da 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 To book an advising appointment, please follow this link. Follow that link. You're gonna click that link. It's gonna take you straight into our actual calendar. And it'll have little gray boxes that you can click on and schedule yourself in. So when you send me an email saying, I'd like to schedule an advising appointment, I'm just gonna say, okay, cool, click the link, right? Go ahead and click the link on the auto response that you got. Apart from that, we also do group advisings. We do those at multiple campuses. So let's say that you're way on the east side and you're like, I really like can't get out to west that often. Take a look at our group advising, follow that link, see when we're gonna be out at east. We can help you out at east. Oh, by the way, for the appointments, we do video advising too. So if you're far away, we can, we can hook up with you uh, video. We don't do phone appointments, okay? Lastly, we have our walk-in hours listed. So you can see I usually put a few weeks out. Um, you can see when we'll have our office hours. Dee Dee has the same thing on hers. And then you can come by. Our office hours are hosted right upstairs at the, um, in the Student Services Center where all those desks are, where all the, the general advisors sit. You just check in up at the reception desk, tell them, I'm here to see Dee Dee. I'm here to see Christina. They will put our names on your sign-in so that we can call you specifically from the line instead of whatever other student is there. We call our students first, right? So that is how you would come see us, right? Um, and so pop quiz, like if you needed to update your residency status, what would you do? Would you see me or Dee Dee? No. Exactly, you'd go to a general advisor at whatever campus is the closest campus to you. You walk on in. What if you have a question about your financial aid? Like is, is my financial aid gonna work for my program? You're gonna see a financial aid advisor for that, right? Um, when you have your assessments and you have your transcripts all in, come see us. If you've already sent your transcripts in and they're just not evaluated yet, bring us a copy of your unofficials. We'll see what we can do. Any questions about how to contact us? Email. So I want to make sure all of you guys get one of those face flyers in the back that have like Didi and mine, like <laughs> our faces, like ah. It has all of our contact information on it. That's the one. That's the one. Um, so it, and also my email is cfolia, c f o g l i a at pima.edu. D D E N O G E A N two at Pima.edu, but it's on there. And we also have a bunch of cards in the back um, and cards for a lot of the directors back there. Any other questions? So your next step, I know a lot of you are gonna have a lot of questions right now. Um, Dee Dee and I have another meeting that we're going to directly after this. So now would not be the best time to come ask us. We have to kind of run. What we want you to do is take a look at the auto response, take a look at the schedule, and then find a time when we're gonna have open office hours to help you. But before you go, if you had an interest in CNA, surgical tech, phlebotomy, medical office programs, medical assisting, you need to see Tamara because she has to sign the permission slip, otherwise they're gonna make you go to another one hour info session, okay? Clinical research, you're gonna see Rita. Far oh yeah, pharmacy, you're gonna see Don. And HPOG, you're, you're gonna see Anel, okay? Phlebotomy? You're gonna see Tamara. Yeah, in the white, in the white blazer. Thank you for coming, guys. Have a great day.